Good morning, Indiana. Good morning, judges. My name is Shannon Sweat, and this will be the Unit 5 final round hearing. In a moment, I will have the judges introduce themselves, followed by you students introducing yourselves to the judges. Students, you will deliver a four-minute prepared statement, and with it being final round, you will have 10 minutes of follow-up questions. My microphone will be muted, but I will be holding up a one-minute and a time signal sign for you. I suggest that you use the gallery view rather than the speaker view for the hearing. And at the conclusion of the hearing, the judges will give you some brief feedback. Judges, when you're ready to introduce yourselves. So, um, so hello again. Uh, my name uh, is Andy Levy. Uh, congratulations on uh, making it to Monday. It's a very exciting day. You're our, you're our first hearing. So uh, we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Um, I am a, a trial lawyer from Baltimore, Maryland, and I also teach at the University of Maryland School of Law. But um, for purposes of this hearing, my major qualification is that I am a proud graduate of IU Bloomington. <laughs> so I'm really thrilled to be uh, judging Indiana here. Hi, good morning. And yeah, congratulations on, on making it to the Monday round. This is where all your hard work really pays off. Uh, my name is Ben Glickman. I'm an attorney with the California Attorney General's Office. Uh, much more interestingly and importantly, I'm an alumnus of this fine program and was on a national championship team uh, way back in 1995. So congratulations on making it to finals. Good morning again, Indiana. Congratulations. I am Gus Chin, a municipal judge from Holiday, Utah, and I am looking forward to a robust conversation this morning and tell us who you are. Um, uh, good morning, esteemed judges. My name is Emerson Cole. Uh, we represent Team Indiana. We come from Fishers High School in Fishers, Indiana. Next year after I graduate, I plan to attend Miami University of Ohio and study political science. Hello, I am Olivia Young. Next year, I hope to attend the University of Michigan to study business administration and public policy. And hi, I am Kaylin Tai. Next year, I plan to go to Purdue University for math education and political science. And here is our jocular teacher, Ms. Paternoster, and not on the Zoom with us, is our intrepid unit advisor, Judge Henke. Okay. Um, hello, congrats to the teacher. And Kaylin, I'll try not to hold the Purdue connection against you. Really <laughs> play no role at all. Um, so, um, so this is unit five, and we're going to do question two this morning, um, which I'll read, and I don't think I can do uh, full justice to the, to the script, but I'll do my best. Uh, the facts are supposed to determine the case. Tenth juror, uh, don't give me any of that. I'm sick and tired of facts. You can twist them any way you like. You know what I mean? Ninth juror, that's exactly the point this gentleman, eighth juror, has been making. Why are juries required to render a unanimous decision rather than a majority decision in most criminal cases? To what extent, if any, do jury trials ensure due process as stated in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights? To what extent, if any, do jury trials reinforce founding principles? And well, you may begin whenever you're ready. In criminal cases, juries must render a unanimous decision because this right is fundamental to the American scheme of justice. If a single person believes the defendant is not guilty, then reasonable doubt the individual did not commit the crime remains, creating a mistrial. Apodica of the Oregon initially ruled that unanimous verdicts were not ruled in state criminal cases and non-unanimous decisions were prominent in Jim Crow, Louisiana. The state legislation which permitted non-unanimous juries was passed in 1881 with the purpose to quote, establish a supremacy of the white race in the state and to regain white control. It accomplished this through convict leasing, a system of forced penal labor that overwhelmingly affected African-American men. In order to expand convict leasing, more people must be convicted of serious crimes, which was easier under legal non-unanimous jury decisions in Louisiana. Even with the presence of a dissenting voice, a black man was still able to be convicted. Non-unanimous juries were finally ruled illegal by the 2020 Ramos versus Louisiana case. However, the case of Edwards v. Vanoy decided that Ramos would not work retroactively. 
Louisiana still holds over 1,500 people that were convicted by a non-unanimous jury. This demonstrates the importance of requiring a unanimous decision to prevent a conviction when there is still reasonable doubt as to their guilt. Allowing majority decisions instead of unanimous ones leaves room for abuse of power in the criminal system, as they were essential in preserving racial hierarchies in the South. Jury trials ensure due process as long as the jurors are given the opportunity to do so. For example, in the case of Arthur Anderson LLP versus United States in 2005, the Supreme Court unanimously found that the jury was improperly taught about the relevant federal statute. The ruling was thus overturned. Jury trials can be effective due process when the judge correctly teaches jurors, when the prosecutor brings ample evidence, and when police investigate properly. Jury trials also protect procedural due process rights. In Patterson v. New York, the Supreme Court held the state must prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, and Taylor v. Kentucky required the presumption of innocence. Jury trials require significant evidence for unanimous verdicts. One major, major procedural due process right seen in the Sixth Amendment is the right to a public and impartial jury. However, sometimes these two rights may be at odds. In high profile trials like those of Derek Chauvin or Travis and Gregory McMichael and William Bryan Jr., the men who murdered Aubred Arbery, jury selection and impartiality were antithetical to each other due to publicization. In the latter case, over 1,000 people were summoned and jury selection took two weeks. Because of extensive media coverage, people who would otherwise be potentially unbiased were ruled out. Although they are imperfect, jury trials reinforce the founding principles of popular sovereignty and limited government by involving citizens in the government process. Jury trials provide the community with insight on how the government works. Potential jurors must study oftentimes lengthy instructions from judges for a full understanding of how trials ought to operate. A recent example would be the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse, in which jurors had to read 36 full pages of instructions in order to grasp their responsibilities during the trial. This preserves popular sovereignty by civically educating the public and giving them the opportunity to be part of governmental processes. Not only that, but this insight allows them to limit their government, as the founders prized the jury trial as a prevention against innocent people being convicted and sentenced by an appointed judge behind closed doors. We have finished our prepared statement, and we are now ready to answer your further questions. Um, thank you very much. Let me uh, remind you to put your uh, notes away, and uh, if you had any. And um, let me begin by um, asking... Um, what, what do you think is the most peculiar aspect of our jury system when viewed by someone who was, you know, said not, was not raised in the United States, was not trained in the United States, and is familiar maybe with systems in some other part of the world? What do you think they look at and find uh, uh, either most peculiar or most unusual? I think what they would likely find most peculiar, especially if they were from Europe, such as uh, areas like Spain or France, would be that our justice system and our jury system is adversarial. Um, here, the purpose of a trial is for one party to overcome another. Um, in, many, in many areas in Europe, however, uh, trials are uh, what we call inquisitorial, which means the judge is in charge of finding facts and the lawyers are only there to make sure that everything goes to procedure. So in, in federal court and in most states, jury deliberations are confidential. We, we, jurors can't be made to disclose what was discussed in the jury room. Do you agree with that policy? And, and what purposes does it serve? I personally agree with that policy because then it keeps the, um, the judge and the, their deliberations and the jury separate. I mean, the purpose is in a jury to ensure that the jury is making the decision and not the judge. And the whole idea is that the judge can't unsee evidence. And so we don't want to be having any of the judge's perceptions be influencing the juries. I absolutely agree with Kaylin here. Um, allowing for the jury to um, deliberate um, kind of a con confidentially um, just allows them to remain unbiased and only deliberating on the facts that they have heard. But but what if their deliberations reveal their bias, right? What, what if a juror is in there 
saying all kinds of racist things or, or, or prejudging the defendant, why shouldn't that be disclosed? Isn't that fundamental to due process to, for people to know that that's what happened in the jury room? Um, I would agree with you. And this is where I would begin to slightly disagree with my colleagues. Um, we can see, especially when it comes to issues such as jury nullification, um, a lot of times what goes on in uh, the jury room, especially if we know it re retrospectively, may be able to help us um, you know, better determine how we can improve our jury trials um, and even problems with specific jurors. And well, honestly, me, I'm, I'm sorry, let me just jump in and, and add the fact that the Supreme Court has ruled that if there are racist things said in the jury room, that's an exception to the, the, the rule that you cited. But, but if there are homophobic things said, that is not an exception. Do you think that's a distinction that makes sense? That really brings me to the same idea of the tiers of scrutiny and also the different suspect classifications and how races and suspect classes, however, gender, sexuality, things like that, um, that is an intermediate. And so any sort of discrimination on those bases, on those bases, they have a lot less power to be able to stop that. I would wholeheartedly um, agree with Kaylin when it comes from where we derive that distinction. However, you are guaranteed the right to an impartial jury. So I would say that we should to change the standards so that if homophobic things are said, um, you know, it's equal, they, that should also be considered. Considering what you have said also in your testimonial regarding uh, a jury, should 18 year olds really be allowed to serve in a jury where they lack life experience and, and other factors that are essential in that decision making process that's so critical? I mean, we trust these 18 year olds also with the ability to vote. And oftentimes when um, jurors are um, selected or summoned for jury duty, they use the voter registration rules. Um, so if we are allowing these 18 year olds to make decisions to elect our representatives as well, I do think they should have the ability to serve for jury duty. Additionally, and to take a more philosophical perspective on this idea, um, 18 year olds, you know, they're permitted to sign commercial contracts and in a very, very similar way attached to the right to vote, 18 year olds are permitted to metaphorically sign the social contract. If we trust them with this, we should trust them with jury trials, which are a preservation of limited government and the social contract. Should juries be allowed, ex explicitly allowed to engage in nullification? Should they be told that they may ignore the judge's instructions on law? Right, so in our state constitution, in Article 9, Section 1, it says that they are to decide both the facts and the laws and to judge both of them. And so jury nullification is allowed in our state. Yes, and not only does it appear in the Indiana constitution, okay. but our unit has read jury pattern instructions where they are equally instructed that they are to uphold the law. Do you see any danger in telling a jury that they are the judge, not only of the facts, but of the law? Um, so I believe it depends. If we go back to the history of jury trials in America, we can look to the John Peter Zanger case, which is one of the earliest examples of this. A uh, publisher was accused of seditious libel against the British colonial governor, but he was acquitted by a jury nullification. In that case, jury nullification was used to protect democracy. Um, and there's also examples during the prohibition where like 60% of jury trials were actually using jury nullification because they didn't believe in the prohibition. And similarly with marijuana trials today, then that happens as well. And so that in these jury nullification cases could in turn maybe change policy to realize it because if we're not following it, then might as well change the laws. Yeah, but, but I mean, jury nullification is not a one-way ratchet, right? It goes both ways. The same thing that allows for a just result uh, to, to nullify an unjust law also acquits the, the people that beat up Emmett Till, right? Uh, and, and so how, how do you decide what's good jury nullification versus what's bad jury nullification? Well, um, one of the examples I think of when I think of bad jury nullification, I think of um, during um, the Civil War era when um, the, in South Carolina, they would stop slave ships and put the captain of the ship on trial and then acquit them. So I obviously think that um, in terms of humanity, there are often, it's a gray area oftentimes. So it really depends on the situation. I don't think there can be a standard deciding if um, 
journal notification is good or bad. Olivia is very right, um, but I'll yeah, you know, take a, an opposite stance to her. Um, we have presented some somewhat positive examples of jury nullification, but my personal opinion is that in most or all cases, it's bad. Jury nullification is antithetical to rule of law because it is inherently the unequal application of the law and given, extremely dangerous. Sorry, given that then, should the judge, in the event of a jury nullification, but for what's noted in Indiana's constitution, be allowed to overrule or overturn that nullification? So there's different circumstances where the judge would be able to potentially do that. So um, if there's like conduct from the prosecutor that is so egregious and deliberate, uh, they call it like an evidentiary harpoon into the case, um, then they're able to change uh, the trial and they're able to um, they're able to decide that that's wrong. Um, yes, although we do know that uh, judges um, in some cases are allowed to overturn convictions, but judges are never allowed to overturn acquittals. But if the jury decides to ignore the law as given by the court, by the judge, and just acquit someone, shouldn't the judge be able to correct that error? Well, in terms of acquittals, um, I don't believe that they should. Um, we are effectively undermining the purpose of the jury and putting our trust into the jury to make the decision with the facts that they have been given. And in that circumstance, if they feel as if nullifying the law is the proper thing to do, then I would agree with that. And uh, one of the other issues with permitting judges to do this is that, as we've spoken earlier, no one's privy to what goes on in a jury room. Now, there are some cases like the Zanger trial we, we mentioned where the lawyer specifically advocates for jury nullification. And then we can hazard it decent guess that that's what happened. But otherwise, it would be extremely difficult to prove that jury nullification has ever occurred. Is, is there a right to a jury trial in civil cases as well as criminal? And if so, what is its source? Um, for civil cases, it's only one third of states that require um, like majority for only a verdict. So what about, federal, what about federally? For federally? Um, I believe that I would use a form of reverse incorporation with Bowling v. Sharp, where um, we, in, uh, using the Fourth Amendment, where we have a unanimous decision from Ramos um, and in all state criminal cases. I think we're almost out of time, but uh, we've talked a lot about juries, but most cases never go to a jury. They are settled via plea bargain. Should plea bargaining be allowed or is it antithetical to the importance of the jury in our system? So uh, I would say that plea bargaining can be a really big problem because then you're not necessarily receiving the due process that you're owed. Um, I see my time has expired. May I quickly continue? Yeah, please finish your thought, finish your sentence. Um, yes, so plea bargaining is extremely dangerous, but what we have to understand is that uh, a lot of times Sometimes it's the lawyers that's advocating for it because they don't feel um, actually that, that their client can win a case due to uh, any amount of bias or the evidence against them. So the ability to win a case is what we should be focusing on and not making um, jury trials seem impossible to the vast majority of defendants. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thumbs up emoji. Um, so, wow, oh, this was so great. Um, what a... So I, um, my two fellow judges did uh, a unit five over the weekend, but I did not. So this is, this is the question like totally new to me. Um, but uh, what a great question. I mean, I, you know, my day job is, um, you know, as a trial lawyer and uh, I have a, um, I mean, there's so many great things about the jury system and, and, but it can, it can be a beast. And, um, and I think you guys showed a remarkable appreciation um, for uh, sort of that, that two-edged sword, uh, if you will. And so I really give you sort of enormous kudos um, for really sort of being able, I think, to appreciate um, sort of many of these difficulties. And another reason why, you know, it's a good question because um, you, there's so many of, you can come, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, in so many respects, and, and you guys certainly um, did that in a very impressive way. Um, I was not familiar um, with the um, with the sordid history of unanimous, non-unanimous uh, juries in Louisiana. That 
uh, uh, terribly interesting to me. Um, the uh, and then interesting, and then segueing uh, from from that to the Arthur, Arthur Anderson case um, is a sort of a nice nice uh, oxymoron, if you will. Um, um, I um, a couple of a um, couple of thoughts. Um, and I thought you handled sort of the international, knowing that knowing the difference in uh, the U.S. system um, from the sort of the, the, the continental system, if you will. We don't really have a lot of time, but I've, on occasion I, I would give uh, lectures to visiting delegations of Chinese judges, and um, which is a totally different system in sort of like like dozens of ways. But they were like. They thought jury trials were like the weirdest thing they had ever heard. And I can remember one asking, like in total seriousness, you know, about the idea. So they just, you know, just guilty or not guilty. And then uh, sort of saying, but, but and so what? They don't have to issue a report. Uh, and I said, well, you know, no. And they said, well, then how do you know it's right? And, and it was just like this total culture shock, uh, you know, really East meets West, if, if, if you will. So. Um, so thank you very much um, for really, I mean, I'm just, you've just really got my, 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 my blood rolling here uh, um, after this. Uh, and what that's like to me, I think that's the ultimate compliment. So good for you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, I, I would echo those comments. I thought you guys did a very nice job. Uh, you know, we, we were pushing you in the, in the Q&A, but you didn't sit back. You kind of leaned in and, and, and and were responsive and adjusted to our questions. I really appreciated how you built on each other or, or, or had a dialogue with each other. And not only within a question, but you would refer back to previous answers or previous questions that had been asked, just showing that you were really engaged in the conversation. Um, so I thought that, that was really, really great. I, I mean, I think it is an interesting question. I think there's lots of uh, challenges with the jury system, but it's, you know, uh, you were able to kind of talk through those. And, and if we had more time, I would have loved to hear, you know, your ideas uh, for how we could improve the jury system. And I'm sure you have many. Um, but yeah, overall, I thought you guys did a very nice job. And it really woke me up this morning and really engaging conversation. So thank you. I agree. Thank you for engaging us being the first team of the morning. I trust that again, by virtue of the preparation you've given, and the effort you put in that you will help to bring about some of those changes. Maybe you'll help them to reverse that Edwards decision on retroactivity, because it seems that you take the position that's not terribly fair. I would also suggest that in terms of how you have approached the subject, that you're now somewhat of experts. So maybe you could share this with your fellow students and colleagues and encourage them when the opportunity, opportunity arises to jump to that, to serve on the jury, even if they're 18 and lack certain life experience because of how you've advocated that they should be able to serve. Thank you, good luck to you. Um, I do, I, uh, I'm sorry, I just forgot to add one thing. Um, I don't see this as a big demerit because of how great you guys did, um, but there is a the seventh amendment to the, uh, in the Bill of Rights, provides for uh, jury trials and civil cases, uh, but only where the amount of controversy exceeds $20. So, um, but any event, so that was just sort of a little bit of a gotcha question, but um, I don't see that uh, given uh, how well you did. Uh, I don't really see that as, as, a, as I say, a big demerit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Indiana. Bye-bye.